welcome everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, Alrighty, so welcome back to Spaces of Exchange, generously hosted by ICFAC. I'm Jacqueline Koch. I'm the curator and the creator of this program. So for those of us, uh, for those who are joining us for the first time, Spaces of Exchange was created in the summer uh, of 2020, towards the end of the first lockdown, which seems like ages ago. Um, it started as a desire to connect uh, Chinese creatives uh, based in geo different geographic regions to discuss um, and you know get together. And then it was ultimately shaped to become this platform where these creatives uh, are not only brought together to unpack broader systemic issues that affect them and their community and their kind of artistic practice, but also to push against the echo chambers that we become so easily trapped in. Um, so tonight for our fourth iteration, and our last one before we take a short break for the holidays. I'm so happy um, to you know, share this episode with artists Shelly Dang and Chris Yin. Um, so today we will be diving into the various popular Asian iconographies presented as food and consumer goods uh, packaging. And we're gonna be unpacking notions of tradition, nationality, and diaspora, as well as the fine line between appreciation and assimilation. So as usual, I'm gonna you know, give a little gentle reminder of the format of the session. Uh, we're gonna start off with a 20 to 30 minute conversation between myself and the artists before moving on to a 20 to 30 minutes public Q&A. Uh, while we're talking, feel free to post any questions that might arise during our you know, kind of initial 20 to 30, 30 minutes discussion in the chat box and I'll go through questions uh, afterwards. Uh, so now, without further ado, so Shelly Zhang is a Chinese-born artist based in Toronto whose work deconstructs notions of tradition, gender, identity, the body, and popular culture while calling attention to these subjects in the context and construction of a multicultural society. She is interested in exploring how multiculturalism, diversity, and assimilation is implemented how this relates to lived experiences and how culture is learned slash relearned and sustained and how things are remembered and preserved. Chris Yin is a second generation Taiwanese immigrant born and raised in California, now based in New York. Her practice focuses on cultural misconnections and embracing the com comedic side of personal experiences as reflection of her personal history. Using humor as a device to help her cope with otherwise embarrassing and awkward misunderstandings, she translates this tool in the form of unlikely groupings of figures and objects in her paintings, as well as distorted scale and skewed perspectives. Her work follows a line of deep interest towards a better understanding of her hyphenated cultural background and the possibility of belongingness and closeness. All right, so jumping right in, I want to start a discussion with a couple of questions. The first one being, um, there are a handful of goods and services that have been categorized as stereotypically Asian. So the ones that come to mind are Lauganma chili oil or bubble tea. Um, I mean, you know, there's, there's so many pecking duck. Um, and it's kind of become really difficult, at least for myself, to, you know, differentiate between appreciation and appropriation. So in other words, um, while I love bubble tea, um, you know, it's a drink that it was made in Taichung, was created in Taichung, and now it's become this kind of like global um, phenomenon. I kind of really don't like the idea that, you know, this Taiwan, like my Taiwanese culture, this part of me has been reduced to like a sugary drink. Um, now, both your works, Shelly and Chris, um, openly tackle this issue and you guys are exploring the inherent contradictions that are embedded in cultural identity and uh, sorry, cultural identity that the diasporic community faces. Um, can you both explain your unique journeys, experiences, maybe share an intimate story or you know, perspective that's led you to the subject matter? Um, any, you know, wh whoever wants to go first. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm happy. I'm happy to start. I, I was actually really excited when you asked this question because mm -hmm. it's simultaneously a frustration and something I'm kind of in the middle about feeling. Um, 
And so for me specifically, even though I work with food symbols and food motifs in my practice, this, this mm -hmm. wasn't something that I intended to start out with when approaching a visual arts practice. Um, but it became inevitable as a subject when looking into the history of the Chinese diaspora because it's so intrinsically embedded into our stories. Mm. And so I think what I sort of are, have arrived at today is the conversation that food is a gateway and food is a learning tool. Um, it holds wonderful in like visceral connotations to like rich and diverse stories. And I think it's also kind of great because um, even though Asian Canadians, Asian Americans have such different diverse stories, histories about how we sort of arrived in the different places we have across the world. Mm -hmm. um, it's a common thread and I really love it as a unifying tool in a way as well. But um, yeah, it's also something where, you know, people are first shamed really easily. And I think it's also a place where we retrace and find a lot of um, pride as well. But I think you've kind of hit the nail on the head when you say that it's it can become a reduction. And quite frankly, it can become really hollow to say that mm -hmm. um, this large group of people can be easily summarized in a Taiwanese bubble drink, right? That's sort of um, not doing our communities justice in a way to say that. Um, and so for me, I think a lot of this conversation sort of started in this project around MSG that I did, which kind of looks into the, the boundaries between appreciation, appropriation, also uh, privileges in the food industry as well. And so I come from a background where I worked in a lot of Chinese restaurants, both high end and quote unquote, low end, I suppose, or more accessible food. Hmm. And so a common question that we would always get is like hold the MSG or no MSG. So mm -hmm. this became a sort of investigation I was interested in looking at. Um, and so for a lot of folks you might not know, MSG actually had this whole life outside of North America prior to it coming to North America and being influenced by um, you know, the, the feelers of white supremacy basically. And What's kind of interesting is also MSG is really popular in like Italian food just because it's really prolific in tomatoes and Parmesan cheese. Um, but for instance, you don't see Italian restaurants having to put up no MSG signs to say that our food is okay and safe to eat. Um, I was actually thinking about this project in relation to COVID lately and thinking about um, the different ways that our dining spaces become politicized and um, have to assume, you know, different prescriptions of safety for uh, by virtue of assimilation, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is this is kind of like um, I included these. This was actually a very recent incident in Toronto, which I wanted mm -hmm. to include. Um, on the left are two interesting images of old. MSG ads, um, it used to, actually it still is sold under this like household name called Accent. Mm. And so you see these lovely uptakes where it's, um, you know, use it on hamburgers, use it on fried chicken, use it on all these common quote unquote, Americanized, Westernized foods. Mm -hmm. And then in 68, when the sort of controversy about MSG came out, once it became labeled as quote unquote bad, it became East Asian, it became Chinese. Um, and now you have restaurateurs trying to profit off the quote unquote novelty of um, ethnic foods while also being able to shed the negativity, if you will. Um, so this past weekend, this like controversy with a, a broth company um, in Toronto mm -hmm. sort of came up. I'll, I'll leave that to internet researchers to look into, is, but a very recent example, yeah. Yeah, no, I definitely remember uh, the the um, restaurant tour in Manhattan that had opened the, uh, the restaurant that was like clean Chinese food. And I was like, I don't, I can't even begin. Like that is so frustrating. Um, and so, you know, I'm really glad that you kind of put that in your slide because I do think that it's, you know, um, something that we face in the diaspora communities. Like the fact that, you know, especially I remember as younger, and I'm sure this is a story that's been told over and over again, which is kind of like, you know, we're growing up, we go to schools, you know, we're embarrassed um, from the smells that coming from our lunch boxes. You know, I remember like my parents, my mom would give me, um, 
homemade dumplings. And if it's not microwave and it's kind of like sitting in room temperature, the smell of the pork can be really strong. Like it can really kind of like take up the entire room. And I remember kids being like, ew, what's that smell? And I had to be like, oh, I don't know what it is. And so now it's like, you know, a thing that everyone, and I just remember being like, I don't, there was that really big part of me that was like living in shame as a younger person. And then when I grew up and I was like, wait, but now it's being profited. And it was just like, there was never a point where I was like, I can be proud, you know what I mean? Like really sit and hold the space on my own. It felt like it was taken from me. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's why I felt like, you know, your work spoke so strongly to me, both your works, because there, it was a real translation of that, but also not just like on that surface level of what I'm experiencing, but there is this deep investigation of like, um, how food can be a, a, like a political territory. It could be a little, like a real political space. Um, but yeah, Chris, I don't know if you want to, um, share your kind of experience and, and your side of the, of uh, the journey, so to speak, and, and how you, it led to your, um, your practice. Yeah. I mean, food, it's sort of the same story that you guys both mm -hmm. shared, you know, it's an easy entry point, I think, to access other cultures in like a very broad sense. Mm -hmm. Um, so I use it like as a means to invite people into my work, but like you guys were saying, it's also like a point of ridicule when I was younger, like the, the smelly thing that you brought to lunch. So in painting food, I'm, I'm always thinking about the ways that I'm connecting with others and celebrating, but also sort of like really unashamedly rejecting any kind of like devaluing or judgment of it. Mm. And so I think there's something really humorous that happens when those two things collide, like the mm. celebration of it and the subversion of it. Mm. Um, and in, in addition to that, like when I'm painting Chinese imagery or Chinese goods, I'm really thinking about like injecting these images into what I think is like a very underrepresented part of the Western art canon. Mm. So thinking about like a disruption to like a long history of Eurocentric painting that has been the focus in America for so long. Um, so, you know, thinking about representation and like wanting to be seen and acknowledged and, mm. but in a way I was like, also like you're saying with the bubble tea, I was really wrestling with this fear of like essentializing, mm. um, and being essentialized. So from there, I tried to build narratives instead that weren't specific to race, but to like a wider variety of experiences, yeah. like where race isn't in the forefront. Hmm. Um, but even in that, I like, I wonder if it's possible to even untwine those experiences from my hmm. cultural background. Yeah. I love how um, there is that thought though, because, you know, in talking about and in preparing for this talk, I've been speaking to a lot of like friends and colleagues and from all different sorts of backgrounds. And that experience of shame is something that resonates like from acro like across the diaspora community. So not just the Chinese diaspora, but like from I remember, you know, from like the Middle Eastern, for example, like, you know, they're coming in with the same kind of feeling of like, oh, but I experienced this too. It might not be with the same dish necessarily, but it is that same feeling. So I, I really appreciate that there's that thought behind it, but also something that you said that really kind of like made me click as well was um, inserting the images into kind of the, like the art history canon um, and the reason why that kind of made me, you know, think about it is because at what point, and I guess I'm, you know, thinking of this question on the fly, at what point do we start to draw this distinction between what's being represented in the art history canon as something that's different from what's being represented on like Western media? So like, you're right, we don't see, you know, for example, um, hot pot you know, in like traditional paintings or like in our, in our art history books, but that's something that we're seeing so much on TV now or like, you know, uh, on mm. social media. So it's kind of like, yeah, at, at what point is it, does it become almost two separate fields and not something that kind of lives and coexists side by side, especially if art is supposed to serve this like kind of social function or it's supposed to be some sort of um, representation or let's just say this kind of uh, a replication of what's of what's happening in the social sphere. So I don't know if you guys feel the same way or can answer that question or. 
Okay, my first thought is I would buy that painting of a hot pot scene. <laughs> and that was, that's first thought number one. Um, I think you bring up an interesting point in terms of kind of like where acceptance for these kinds of foods is relegated. Mm. You know, like some sometimes I do watch a lot of, um, you know, cinema featuring East Asian people that comes out, for instance, and there's like comedy is a very common thread, for instance, mm. and I'm I don't know too much about that, but I am kind of curious, like, why is it that either people gravitate towards this industry or perhaps, you know, there's a, a pushing towards that industry kind of a thing. So mm -hmm. it is quite, I think that's a sort of other conversation in terms of what spaces are um, permitted, are we permitted to occupy with these images kind of, you know? Um, there, Yeah, in a way, I think we don't have to necessarily replicate the, the prior canon, but we're remaking our own, which is exciting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I actually started as a painter and like hats off to you, Chris, because it's it's not an easy, easy medium <laughs> to work in. And, and then I sort of like realized that I became more interested in signs and symbols and went to photography more so mm -hmm. um, because I, I see it as almost like the dominant language of contemporary culture. It's, it's everywhere now and to, to work with that to revisit that is kind of something I'm interested in a little bit. Mm -hmm. But it is, I mean, like, I love that. I love that question. Like, where is it relegated to? Like, where does sign and symbol hold the most um, value? I mean, and not to make it only about kind of like this conversation of capitalism and Marxism or anything like that, but it is asking that question. Like, you know, um, I was reading this uh, paper and, and the tagline, and I mean, it's like a, it's, um, you know, an academic journal, but it, the tagline was like, if it doesn't spread, it's dead. It's actually, a, it was, you know, became the inspiration for a book called Spreadable Media. Um, and it's like, if it doesn't spread, it's dead. And it's talking about like viral memes and stuff. And it just got me thinking like, you know, these images that you guys are working with this, you know, this, these icons, these symbols that you guys are working with, it's like, it shows up so much more in that social sphere. And like you were mentioning, Chris, not so much in the art history. So it is, you know, I'm kind of, thinking, um, you know, while you guys are speaking, like, oh, interesting how they exist side by side, or they, sh you know what I mean, in a way they do, but then when you're seeing it on paper, it doesn't. It's like, it is in a very separate space. Um, but that actually leads me to kind of like this really uh, nice segue to my next question, which is about multiculturalism. Um, and it is, you know, um, I, I, I think it's such, I think multiculturalism is such a tricky, and loaded term. I mean, Shelly, you and I were, you know, living in Toronto. Um, you know, it's a, it's a city and especially a country that kind of boasts uh, itself to be like, you know, embracing and accepting of all cultures and ethnicities. And Chris, you come from, you know, um, from California, you know, and it's also a state that is, uh, um, has a mixed, you know, demographics. And so I've come to really question the intention intentionality of this term, right? In the same ways that I do for the word diversity. Um, and so I, I guess I wonder what are your respective thoughts um, and how do you define multiculturalism? Like, what does it mean for you guys to be, what, what does it mean to be multicultural or to be living in a multicultural place? Um, yeah, I don't know if, if you guys, you know, kind of feel that way, um, like that kind of struggle. <laughs> Every time I hear the word multiculturalism, diversity, I kind mm. of have to take a step back a little bit because it's yeah. it's definitely a word that means something different to everybody, right? Mm. Yeah. Um, and specifically, I think the, these words mean absolutely nothing without considerations of power in action. So very similar to food, it they just they're uh, you know feminism TM kind of a thing, mm -hmm. um, multicultural TM. Um, and living in Canada has been really interesting because like I, I first settled in North America living in the States and so totally different policy of like melting pot versus multiculturalism that we have here. Mm. And I think one of the biggest fallacies with multiculturalism is this conception that it is an altruistic act granted by the state, mm. which discounts for you know, all the effort that communities of color, women, immigrants, and workers have fought for, for us to have these rights. Um, yeah. 
I feel like Canada has this perception where it's like we're this you know utopic neighbor of the U.S. and that didn't come without its own hardship Mm. and that has ongoing like prevalent issues still Mm. um you know like the 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 Mountie is like the perfect example it's like this cutesy cop (laughs) that Mm. was that's like become the logo for Canada and was created just quite literally to police and intimidate indigenous communities you know Mm. um or like specifically in Toronto you know our city slogan is diversity is our strength, which was um, decided not too long after the multicultural policy was implemented. But we we have 25 city councillors and four of them are councillors of color, despite having like a 51% visible, visible minority majority population. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually the New York specifically does much better than, uh, than us on this because yeah. um, you folks have like 51 counselors and I think there's like 20 something who are visible minority. So it's like, oh my God, you know, like these, these nuances kind of get lost when mm. um, you can check box multiculturalism in that way. Mm. Yeah, I mean, LA is also technically very diverse, but I think it's still incredibly segregated, you know, and so much of that segregation has to do with like a long history of like the city's essentially forced racial segregation Mm -hmm. through public housing, through like discrimination in homeowning and redlining. So while I do think that there's like cross pollinating happening um, that can appear as multiculturalism, there's still actually not enough integration in schools and workplaces Mm. in just different neighborhoods. And so Um, I do think multiculturalism can be good in ways of like, you know, exposure to other cultures, but it is tricky. I do feel like it is like like a, oh, we check this box. And so Mm -hmm. now we're in the clear because we've hired X amount of people. We've um, integrated X amount of people. And so, um, yeah, I, I think it's tricky in that way, but I do think it's possible to like maintain distinct cultural identities without Mm -hmm. being like physically and racially segregated the way that so many large cities are. New York even is very Mm -hmm. segregated and there's neighborhoods and pockets of, you know, various people. So um, I think it's a matter of asking ourselves like what does inclusivity actually look like and what does like true Mm -hmm. multiculturalism look like? And also what it does too, right? Like what, what should multiculturalism achieve almost? Um, and I think that's a really, I mean, I loved how you guys both touched upon this idea of like, like check marking almost as if like, it's a numbers game, like, oh, you know, how many people of percentage or, or, you know, um, kind of almost like it's a, it's, it's a thing that you do. And then you kind of mark it off the box and it's like, you know, you get a thumbs up for, for having included like that diversity number. Um, and it's just like, you know, it's been such a, like, almost like a kismet thing that, I, that I'm experiencing because I'm also reading um, Sarah Ahmed's uh, On Being Included. Um, and it's a wonderful, beautiful book. And I just wanted to share a quote um, that I you know, picked out specifically. And I was like, oh, it fits you know, perfectly for today's kind of like session um, that you know, she addresses specifically about you know, the multicultural nation. So here's the quote, um, conditional hospitality, which was a term that was uh, um, coined or I guess proposed by Derrida. Conditional hospitality is when you are welcomed on condition that you give something back in return. The multicultural nation functions this way. The nation offers hospitality and even love to would-be citizens as long as they return this hospitality by integrating or by identifying with the nation. And I just felt like when I read that, I thought that is very, it rings so true. I mean, like, you know, cause we're talking about appropriation, you know, appreciation, but also assimilation. I mean, like when you move to a place that needs to be multicultural, there is this kind of gray area on how much can you hold on to that really like is yours and you're not going to feel shameful about it and then how much you want like willing to let go so that you don't become shamed for it so that you kind of fit in and it's almost become this thing where um i wonder like you know as a multicultural city or country or area 
you know, that, that kind of power exchange, that power dynamic is so strong and so important to talk about and to unpack. Like, they, like, it's almost like, you know, we're being welcomed into a place. It's people of color are being welcomed into a place. We're not holding that space. That space has been, has, it's been permitted, you know, like we have, and it's just a strange kind of tension. And I feel like when we talk about multiculturalism in this way, at least when I do, I'm always just like, so hesitant to get into that conversation. I'm always like, oh God, <laughs> you know, like this is a Pandora's box that I don't really know if I'm ready to open. Um, but it, it, you know, it kind of sounds like you guys share the same, almost like, you know, it, like it, similar views, let's say. Yeah, it's, it's kind of amazing. Um, like this premise of multiculturalism that can be undone with such little words. Like when someone mm -hmm. asks you, where are you from? Or to tell you to go back to your country, like that myth is sort of completely shattered when um, these words are exchanged a little bit, I suppose. So underlying this like, um, you know, everybody hold hands kind of thing is still these these prevalent tensions that haven't mm. gone away. Yeah, yeah, and it's like you were saying about systems of power and appropriation and how those things interact. And so yeah. assimilation is such a key part, I think, of multiculturalism, mm. um, unfortunately, but yeah. Um, I actually really liked, like, I think this also links back to your previous question in terms of how different communities are relegated, right? Um, I feel like when I see, you know, when I see like Burberry marketing Lunar New Year things to me, it's <laughs> on one side, it's like, oh, they see me. And then it's like, oh, they see me as a consumer <laughs> for luxury goods. So it's like putting in these boxes where culture is um, accepted and permitted exactly to Sarah Ahmed's quote. Yeah, and also purchasable, which kind of yes. you know brings <laughs> kind of this nice tie to you know the 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 the, quite, the initial kind of like prompt of of this program, which is you know packaged foods and things get, that can be sold and you know uh, um, hot sales and and you know kind of like that saying if it's if it's uh, if it doesn't spread it's dead right it has to be like a hot thing or a, a, you know some sort of um what's the word com a commodified good. Um, but yeah, so, you know, the one, I guess I had a, also another question that I wanted to throw out there, um, which is that, you know, both of your works deal with at least, you know, implicitly um, the idea of like memory and preservation and, and things that get passed down, which is, you know, kind of a difficult concept to capture. Um, you know, there's something to be said about the act of remembering and forgetting. So it's not just this, uh, or I, I guess it exists in a liminal space, right? So that's to say like, it's both a choice or it can be a choice where you like actively remember something, but then there's also that kind of gray area where you, it, it really just is just chance. Like sometimes you just forget things, you know, your brain just doesn't have the capacity to remember everything that you go through. Um, but it, I mean, even that's almost a too, like too simple, um, of a definition because ultimately what gets passed down, whether it's by choice or you know by chance, especially in the diaspora, um, can really uh, change you know certain symbols or certain signs. Like these can take on new meanings. They can have they can have heightened value um, over years and especially over generations and over um, continents too. So can you guys talk a little bit about the choices that you've made as artists documenting the elements um, otherwise construed as Chinese and how that fits into the larger discussion of diaspora culture? Um, yeah, any. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah I, I, I think about this quite a bit in terms of like, um, a, the privilege I have in being able to be a, a visual artist and someone mm. who gets to work with culture in defining and making cultural meaning. Um, and I think with that comes a, a certain power of credibility, right? Is I get to um, uh, ask viewers, participants, et cetera, to side aside both mental and mental space and physical time to be able to look at something and pause at something. Mm. Um, and with that comes quite a bit of responsibility too. Um, so kind of like thinking back to this project on MSG that I did a few years ago, I spoke to this food historian who, um, you know, really 
gave me a breakdown of like the the complexities in being able to talk about this as an artist mm. versus uh, the implications of like this substance on like restaurants, for instance. So I get to um, have flexibility in certain spaces where um, other you know people don't kind of a thing. So realizing the the space in which I occupy too. Mm. Um, I'm I'm kind of interested in like complicating the conversation on what Chinese is just because it's been a question mark in my life for quite some time like if I'm here I'm not Chinese if I'm there I'm not Chinese like um, according to some schools apparently Asian people are looped in with white folks for universities now like the definition is constantly changing and in flux and I think that's good because again um there's no need to oversimplify these um, these identities, these communities. Hmm. And so that's kind of what I'm interested in is this like complication of what it could mean and the multiplicities that it can simultaneously exist in. Yeah, I love the use of that word complication. That just makes so much sense to me. <laughs> and I like heavily identify with that. Yeah. And confusion. <laughs> oh, definitely confusion. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I love painting from memory. And so I think there, for me, it's also like a space of complication mm -hmm. in that like there's a sort of an unpredictable thing that can happen when there's like space for a loose interpretation or reinterpretation of something. Mm -hmm. um, and I like, I'm a lover of storytelling. So I, I do that in my own work and I like enjoy the way that things can sort of take on new meanings as they get like shared and reshared and then become complicated. Um, so, and not to say like the truth isn't important. I feel like I'm just saying like the truth can be complex, um, especially when you take into account like who's recording the truth and who's, mm -hmm. um, who's telling the truth. And so I'm really fascinated with like the idea of oral histories and um, how much power it gives to the storyteller. Mm -hmm. And I feel like often those are the histories that like go unrecorded or aren't seen as accurate because they're based on memory and they're not seen as, as a valid thing. And so this type of storytelling is like the value that I hope that my work can bring to the diaspor diasporic culture. Mm -hmm. um, maybe just having like wider different perspectives will lead to like a greater preservation of culture. Mm -hmm. I actually love um, that the word responsibility was thrown out there. And I really wonder, I mean, like, um, you know, I certainly do feel a little bit of that, you know, pressure to be careful in what I choose to uh, present. And especially, you know, in terms of like my truths and my versions of things. But I wonder if you guys as artists feel um, that kind of similar sense of like, I need to you know, when I'm documenting, and this is not to say that you have to like really carefully, you know what I mean? Like pick things out within, you know, with like this uh, fear of what other people are going to, you know, to, to uh, or how other people are gonna interpret your work. But I just wonder, is there that kind of like aesthetic responsibility that you guys are also thinking about when you guys are choosing to, you know, um, show or present a certain uh, perspective? I think it's like, um, it depends on who my intended audience and community is a little bit. So, you know, for certain things that aren't translatable to certain audiences, it's sort of like that, that might be part of the, the reading of it mm -hmm. a little bit. And then for others, it's sort of like a, a more open dialogue on like, how does, how does this circulate in your life versus my life, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. kind of a thing. Um, so again, it's kind of a bit varied, I suppose, but I think that that responsibility, it definitely is like in my practice, but it's also so much in like day to day as well. Like I'm learning to drive right now and I'm like, oh my God, I need to be the best driver ever to not, not <laughs> fulfill this stereotype because it'll impact all other Asian women, you know? So it's, it's kind of, um, in a way, I don't know an existence outside of that that linkage, but also simultaneously, there's a there's a beautiful like shared indebtedness in that in that linkage a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree. I feel like there is 
there is just like a constant desire to like combat stereotypes and like to fall into any kind of category or to be essentialized. And so you're constantly working against that, but also wanting to stay true to yourself and your, your history and your culture. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. But I think that, and not, but sorry, I didn't mean that as like a, like a contrast that I just wanted to add on to it. There's something that's really interesting about the work that you guys do um, that's, you know, kind of tied to this idea of responsibility, even though it doesn't have to be like a, a direct link. Um, there's this, and, and it's, it shows up, you know, very much in your work, Chris, where it's like reappropriate, no, it's, it's reappropriating what was appropriated. It's like taking back uh, this, the, the, it's taking back the stereotypes basically it's it's you know it is saying like okay this was commodified or you know this is the thing that shows up a lot uh, or hot pot is you know, super awesome and super like you know um uh, uh, like a go-to di- a place that people want to eat now but like i'm going to reclaim it as mine and that spin um is really interesting and it does show up in your work too shelly where like you know the idea of like okay um how do we take something that has once been seen in a certain way, but play on it, you know? And so it's not like this aggressive rejection or resistance, but rather this like full immersion, full acceptance, but still this reclamation. And I think that that's kind of like a really beautiful way of creating that space and that agency um, for yourselves. And also for like, you know, the the people who, who read the works and feel like, okay, this is kind of something that I, I relate to, and I, I don't know. Correct me if I'm if I'm wrong at any point in, in you know the way that I interpret your work, at least. No, I think that yeah, that's. I, I, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. You go. Um, no, I think that that's a definitely an accurate read. I think I initially, because I you know grew up um, reading comics and watching cartoons and very like Americanized television, and it was like sort of my access point into mm-hmm. American culture. Um, and to like learn about American culture outside of my house and to be able to shift from like being a child and feeling shame about certain things in your culture or your identity and be able to sort of move to a place where you're really proud of that and um, almost in like an obnoxious way and then you know finding like the balance after that of like Mm. where where do you fit in your Americanness? Where do you fit in your Chineseness? Um, and navigating that, I think it's, I mean, it's always tricky. I think it's a gray, a gray area. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think like this kind of, Chris, I'm thinking to kind of your earlier point about these essentialist, um, these, how these symbols become sort of essentialized. And to a degree, sometimes it's sort of like, these are just things um, in everyday life. You know, like these are, these are actually chili jars just in people's homes. These are motifs existing in our spaces. And so um, I think the, like the reading of it in terms of an othering is perhaps sometimes also like dependent on the viewer where it's, Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's very normal, quote unquote normal in, in every day in a way, right? As opposed to like something that is um, not necessarily intentionally shot out, but is just kind of like there and, Mm -hmm. Um, you live with it because it's there and process it because it's there. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if, um, you know, in thinking about the other, I wonder how much active engagement we are thinking about that. I mean, like, I, you know, at least in, uh, for myself, that it's been a, it's been a huge interest in, in this kind of like idle consumption that we just do, like, both of like food but also like what we see and like you know consuming images as well like I just wonder how much of that is being absorbed and then like kind of almost like this in one ear out the other scenario versus we're actually sitting there we're actually processing we're actually seeing like okay these are the power dynamics in place but I don't think that everyone is doing this and I'd be you know a a little bit weirded out if everyone was like sitting there being like let's think about the power dynamics but I do think that like there needs to be some of that kind of um, engagement on a, on a kind of on a more, you know, level, again, going back to responsibility on this kind of like active personal, you know, individual responsibility that we're not just um, uh, t- 
taking things for granted, I guess, is what I'm trying to say, you know, that we're actually kind of sitting there and thinking like, okay, you know, there is more to this than just meets the eye. Um, at least that's what I hope that, you know, um, is ultimately achieved. And when we're um, engaging in these kind of purchasing, right, this act of like constantly consuming, constantly consuming. Um, but yeah, and, you know, I hope that, you know, we're opening this up to, to um, the listeners and they can kind of, you know, pass on their questions um, onto the chat. Oh, oh, there we go. Ruby is just kind of prompting um, for people to, to share their questions. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, Chris, I, there was one piece specifically that I adored, which um, was your picking duck. It was in the form of like slippers, if I'm if I remember correctly. And I just wanted to know if if um, and I'm gonna share it. If you could talk a little bit about the um, inspiration behind that specific work. Um, yeah. It so it's a ceramic piece where they're shoes, um, but they're in the shape of like what you would see hanging outside mm -hmm. of a, a restaurant window, which is. Um, like just a bunch of lined up ducks. And so it's uh, glazed in a way that looks similar to an actual pecking duck. And I made it um, at this residency. Oh, is it being oh, no. <laughs> down. There. Um, I made it at a residency where uh, it's sort of like a shared space and everybody's hanging their clothes on a clothesline after it's been washed. Um, and it was just like filled with what felt like a lot of American, like very super American clothes. Um, so I had the idea to make these shoes and sort of, I guess in the way that I, I think of the work being subversive um, to hang these amongst like all of these really like American looking white tube socks and like t-shirts. Um, as sort of like this is my this is my area and this is my culture on display and um it's sort of the same way that you would see it hanging on in a restaurant so yeah it's a little ridiculous but but i think it's like um i remember looking at it and then being like a i want that <laughs> i was like I, mean, I need that hanging somewhere like in my kitchen or you know somewhere um, but I loved how, like, you had used the word obnoxious. I love how, like, in your face it is, though. You know, it's, it's, un it's not shy at all. It's, you know, it is what it is. Um, and, you know, and, and that kind of goes to say, like, all your works are, are kind of like that. I mean, the other one that I saw as well was uh, the meat, the meat number 13. And this is like, you know, when you go into uh, any grocery store, but I guess, for myself who you know I, I go to a lot of Chinese supermarkets like the meat is just displayed everywhere in that way in that really kind of like in your face way um, um and I, I yeah I just I you know just going back on this idea of like you know re reclamation there is that that kind of um yeah that that kind of really direct aggressive you know, uh, um, push that you have and, and, you know, and I think that's really strong and likewise for your works too, Shelly. I mean, there is like, a, like the MSG work is very specific to, uh, to this idea of like humor, but as well as, you know, it's, it's there, we use it, but so does every other culture and, you know, like, what are we going to, you know, what are you going to do about it kind of thing? Um, but it, it, I would love to know if you want to talk a little bit about this series that you've done. Yeah, um, Chris, I love the, the beaks on the ducks. I think <laughs> that's like the epitome of the exaggeration you're sort of talking about. Um, and so this, this series is a series I did starting in 2018 until now. And so it was quite a pivot from the MSG project, which was very like research heavy. And um, the, the question that I kept getting from, from that body of work was sort of like, what is it? Is it bad for you, et cetera, et cetera. And so I found the reception of that work was very much like, became very much me having to prove something to audience and viewers, which was okay. Cause I'm, I'm interested in that conversation a little bit. 
Um, but kind of thinking to this, this like question about redefining meaning. Um, I, this project that I did here is a very much more sentimental project, I would say, where um, it definitely still sort of is a compilation of like stories around fruit, vegetables, home gardens, um, the labor of bringing these fruits from the environments which they're grown to here to the shops that sell them, to um, the acts of display and sort of uh, ritual that they incur. And so it's kind of a, a homage project to um, family, but also to like different legacies, for instance. So like the, the piece on the left is like a ceramic piece that I took with me from the last time I went back to Beijing. And um, it's sort of like a, a portrait of my grandfather, I would say. And then the piece on the very left, for instance, is kind of like looking to the story of like Bing cherries in the US and um, you know, how they're, how they were cultivated by this like early Chinese settler who like made this amazing species of cherries that we all love and cherish today. Um, but he was, uh, after he cultivated these cherries, he went back to China and then was barred from coming back to the States. So kind of like these legacies of labor that sort of happened. Mm. Um, and specifically, I was interested in making a project that was less didactic, where, um, you know, uh, in certain mm. respects, it's like these stories have to be told as opposed to read throughout um, in that way. But um, through visual signifiers, there's sort of still sort of embedded clues in that story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm just going to see if, oh, we still don't have any questions. But um, I mean, we can, we, <laughs> I'm happy to keep talking and asking you guys questions. But please, guys, if you guys have any, um, any questions that you guys want to ask, you know, be happy to be happy to share uh, or, you know, to continue the conversation. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think what's like um, really, what I really like about having a work that's not didactic, um, and that's not to say that your, you know, your other works um, weren't, weren't great, but I do think that there is this accessibility um, that goes beyond Chineseness. And I, I actually do, I actually am wondering about that as well, especially when I'm, um, encountering or facing works that are using a lot of Chinese motifs and a lot of Chinese themes. I'm wondering how artists are um, making that space and that work available for a non-Chinese community. And I, I don't know if you guys, um, like if that becomes a, a thinking process in, in when you guys are, are creating the work. Um, yeah, for me, there was like a project that I had done um, a series of work of just bottles and um, there were medicine bottles and there were condiment bottles mm -hmm. and in labeling them, it felt like it was more about the good and the commercial good and seeing like Chinese writing on something. Um, so I stripped all those off and it just becomes more about the piece itself, it becomes more about the object um, right. versus like some kind of identifying language or like visual mm -hmm. language or um, verbal language. And in those pieces, I am thinking about the ways in which you can hold something and feel like experience the feeling of like being young and holding something. And so these objects are like slightly larger than um, what they are in real life. and really like emphasizing the feelings and experiences behind the actual object and it being like a visual um, sort of like entry point for like uh, for Chinese-ness, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Shelly, do you like, um, are you thinking about an audience that's beyond Chinese when in creating your works? It's, it's kind of interesting when um, that sort of conversation, I would say largely happens like once it's made and continues to get made a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so like an extension of the, the fruit photo series that I did, for instance, were some sculptures. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting to have a conversation when um, people would be extremely familiar with what the fruit pieces were and then mm -hmm. other folks would be less familiar for instance and so that I think is sort of the point of engagement where you can 
um, it's sort of like two different thinkings in terms of what conjures up fruit and you try to find a commonality to sort of explore um, where there's like you know congruencies with what um what this this quote unquote foreign thing looks like to what it is now and how it circulates now a little bit mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um so we do have one question it's for you chris it's could you talk about the inspiration for your everything is exactly the same pieces yeah um i don't do we want to pull that yeah up? i'll pull it up um let me just So let me just get out of this one over here. Oops, that's not right. Hold on, let me just try this again. Um, sorry about that, guys. All right. Why is this not working? Okay, here we go. Sure. Okay. I think it's a bit further down. Um, it's just a series of still lives. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's not coming. I think my computer is maybe glitching out. Um, but if it's up, then that's fine. Uh, so it's just a series of still lives and in the way that still lives sort of like capture um, everyday life or like a specific moment. I also think of them as sort of like an intimate look into someone else's world and um, but also like reflects like culture of the time as a whole. And mm -hmm. so for me, these objects, they hold um, like really sentimental value and are specific markers of time as well. So like it's something that dates back to like a very specific moment um, I've captured in an, in an object for myself. And so I think there's a point in which like the inanimate object can become an animate object as it like activates memory and um, and even in the shadowing of it, the shadows are mismatched to like sort of suggest confusion or that like appearances aren't what they seem that they mm -hmm. can be deceiving. So um, they act as signifiers of identity or representation and um, I think there's just like a fluidity and interchangeableness to like the objects or in this case like the objects being used as identity signifiers um, and so this is like obviously from a, a shrooms or a, a weed trip but this is like that we're all sort of made of a, a made of the same substance um, that we are the object and the object is us and that there's an interchangeability in that and in identity that you are the same human as I am. Mm. Um, and that's where this series sort of started. Thank you. Oh, we have another question. Um, as artists of color, how do you keep your work from becoming too self-referential, like an imitation of yourself and being compartmentalized into a category of Asian artists? This is such a, it's such a good question. And I think it's a constant battle <laughs> because it's like, when do you become um, essentialized? Like right back from the start of the conversation that we were sort of having. Um, I think to a certain extent, like it's, it's one can't, for me, one can't exist without the other a little bit. Like mm. I, I am an artist, I'm also all these other things. And under that umbrella, I will always be an Asian artist. And so um, the, there's like, you know, certain boxes that I can put in as part of that conversation a little bit, for example, like the, the panels I'm invited to be on, which are like conversations that I like, but, um, you know, I would love to be invited to speak on a panel about like color, for instance, like mm -hmm. something as straightforward and simple as that. So I think it's, um, it's partially like just looking at how works are received and circulated in the world. So to one extent, I love like conversations like these where I get to speak with two other um, individuals that I feel affinities with. But I think it's also um, the need to sort of expand on the fact that like Asian art artists doesn't have to be just for Asian audiences, right? Mm -hmm. The same with like how white art has never been for just white audiences in that same way. Um, so to a certain degree, I think it has to 
relate to the conversation of like what is like what Chris is saying, what was the what is the canon? Um, how do we define what gets attention under that canon? How do we uh, carve space in that canon? Mm -hmm. Chris, do you feel like, um, or how do you feel, um, how do you keep yourself, sorry, from, from becoming compartmentalized? Um, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I think I mentioned earlier, it's something that I've struggled with of like, um, moving in and out and through what it means to be Asian and what it means to be American, mm -hmm. um, but always being an artist. And I think a lot of that responsibility is also about the art world changing um, and the way that we get invited to certain things and not to other things and the way that we get pigeonholed into some things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I also think it's just a sheer, like not a numbers game, but it's like the amount of artists that aren't white in the art world. And as, as that changes, I think maybe the compartmentalizing also shifts. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, we do have one last question here. Shelly, can you talk about your relationship with pattern and wallpaper? How did you choose the backdrop of each of the fruit photographs? And what was the process like of making the fruit pattern for your abundance splits? I will share the, um, the image while you speak. Um, Christina, thanks for this question. Um, I'm a big fan of pattern and, and wallpaper, as you can probably tell. And there, there's something about the, the power of repetition, I would say, in terms of like almost like a re, like an affirmation in a way. Um, and I, I consider like backdrops, wallpaper, tablecloths, um, which are what the abundance fruit plinths are made of as, as sort of like witnesses in a way. So somewhat when I think of like the, the things in my photo as subjects or portraits, um, I think of the, the other, the quote unquote negative space of these as like, um, as, as witnesses. And so there's this project I'm working on now, for instance, where I'm looking at these um, uh, two restaurant spaces that happened in Saskatoon and so they have this amazing wallpaper in these old spaces, um, which were, you know, quote unquote, this sort of like witness to what happened in those spaces during that time. And so when I look at these photos of these wallpapers from back in the day, it's sort of like I'm going in my research, I'm going back in this time machine and then I'm pulling out this detail that's sort of like, um, um, like a reoccurring memory in a little way. So the process of like selecting the paper um, patterns for this series was largely kind of like matching up to what a created setting could look like. Um, I would say this series is very much like relegated and intended to be in a domestic space, like referring to the domestic space. So also thinking of like the history of like um, hand painted wallpapers and um, Chinese aesthetics in wallpapers and sort of those conversations as well. So kind of like extending the, the implicit domestic within the objects into um, a more sculptural component. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when I install these works, I even extend it into like a vinyl wallpaper too. Um, yeah. Yeah, I was gonna ask, I was, you know, um, when you install it, is it like the entire room or the entire wall or is it just, uh, or is it just in one kind of area? There's been there's been different interpretations. Actually, the the curator of this project, Tiffany, is here, so I'm just gonna like embarrass her and thank her for being here for a moment. Um, but for like that particular hanging, we were very intentional about like the color choices to match um, the frame, the extensions of the wallpaper in the images, but also like the framing of the the things themselves. So in a way, it's sort of like there's an image of a subject and then the actual frame and photograph becomes a sculptural component too that then sits on this flat wall. So kind of playing with this idea of like the 2D versus the 3D, mm. the image versus the, um, the literal, the referential versus the, the thing almost in a way. Awesome, thank you. Thanks, um, well, Christina. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are out of questions, but also out of time. Um, 
So, you know, thank you guys for, for listening in. Thank you, Chris. And thank you, Shelly, for joining um, me today and, and having this like really awesome discussion. I would like was have been thinking about this compartmentalizing question for so long, which is why I have this like face on. I'm like, oh, it's such a good question. And I like have to unpack it a little more and I wish I had time. Um, but it was so wonderful to be able to, to connect with you guys. And thank you so much, um, Rubita and Nez and ICFAC for um, hosting uh, this, this, this uh, program on your platform. So thanks, um, thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to you both. Have a good night. Bye.